What's up, peers, and welcome to Bitcoin to the Max here on the World Crypto Network. Uh, today, we finally uh, get to finish up on the amazing book, uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money? Well, the first uh, part of it, at least. Uh, and the book is available for free, uh, both the PDF and audiobook on Mises.org, amazing resource. So uh, go on and get it. Uh, today, we are talking about the summary of the first part. And uh, looking back on what we have learned about Bitcoin in a free society. Well, we have learned that all Bitcoin has originated and must originate as a useful, scarce commodity chosen by the free market as a medium of exchange. The unit of money is simply a unit of well, weight or satoshis of the monetary commodity, scarce commodity. Usually, well, a metal, uh, but it can also be, of course, Bitcoin or a shitcoin. <laughs> Under freedom, the scarce commodities chosen as money and their shape and form are left to the voluntary decisions of free sovereign individual nodes on the network. Private coinage is the private pr uh, development of the user interface uh, to that is a wallet. And therefore, it is just as legitimate and worthwhile as any other business activity. Thank you for all the developers working on amazing wallet software, like Adam Nopara working on Wasabi. The price of Bitcoin is its purchasing power in terms of all goods in the economy. And this is determined by its supply and by every individual's demand for Bitcoin. Any attempt by government to fix the price will interfere with the satisfaction of peers' demand for Bitcoin. If peers find it more convenient to use more than just one shitcoin as money, then the exchange ratio between them on the market will determine will be determined by the relative demand and supply and will tend to equal the ratios of their representative purchasing power. Once there is enough supply of a coin to permit the market to choose it as a money, so increases in supply can improve no, no increases in supply can improve its monetary function. An increase in money Bitcoin supply will then merely dilute the effectiveness of each Satoshi or Bitcoin without helping the economy. An increase in the stock of Bitcoin or shitcoins, however, fulfill more non-monetary wants, uh, such as a digital collectible as Nick Salvo points out so prevalently, served by the coin, uh, or Dogecoin, by the way, right? Uh, and is therefore socially useful. Inflation, an increase in money substitutes not covered by an increase in the Bitcoin on-chain, is never societally useful but merely benefits one set of people at the expense of another. Inflation being a fraudulent invasion of property could not take place in the free market. Or oh, as we have seen, how fantastically has Mount Gox collapsed? In sum, freedom can run a monetary system as superbly as it runs the rest of the economy. Contrarily to many writers, there is nothing special about Bitcoin that requires extensive government dictation. Here too, free sovereign nodes will best and most smoothly supply all their economic wants. For Bitcoin, as for all other activities of men, liberty is the mother, not the daughter of order. Pierce, this has been the very first part, uh, which basically covers money in a free society or Bitcoin with free sovereign nodes. And again, I mean, this, this book is just phenomenal, right? Let's, let's go a bit uh, on what was here in this chapter. And that was first the value of exchange, right? Why peers actually engage in mutually beneficial exchange 
all because they are better off. That's why they do it. <laughs> then barter or a level of multi-coinery, right? Uh, which is a huge uneasiness as it has a lot of calculational costs and it limits, uh, the, uh, it limits the amount of transactions possible. Then indirect exchange, which basically is when Bitcoin emerges as a useful medium of exchange, which can be stored for a later purpose. Then the benefits of Bitcoin, oh, there are many, mainly to postpone one's consumption and of course use as a store of value and medium of exchange and unit of account the Bitcoin unit and that it doesn't matter if you calculate in Bitcoin or Satoshis, right? If you calculate in ounces or grams, it doesn't matter. It's the same monetary unit, which is uh, the importance. The shape of Bitcoin. And again, here Rothbard differentiates between open dime transactions, on-chain transactions, single signature transactions, multi-sig transactions, uh, and of course, off-chain transactions, such as the Lightning Network. It's all in this book, incredible. Private coinage, or again, how, how individual developers can provide a user interface to the underlying Bitcoin and make sure that it is actually a convenient way of using uh, this, this Bitcoin and easily verify it. Uh, the proper supply of money, destroying all the FUD, about the unchanging money supply of Bitcoin and that it's so bad for, uh, for, for the economy as it, as it cannot adjust uh, to, to the demand. Oh, how horrible is that? Well, it's not. The money supply should be stable. And the fact that the money supply is stable for Bitcoin is phenomenal. The problem of hodling, uh, this is, I think, my, my favorite chapter in this book because I think it's the best explanation on why people hodl. And that hodling fundamentally um, it provides the value to this money, right? Because if you don't hodl the money, well, it's just a useless token. The stabilizing the price level. Again, this destroys the class A FUD of Bitcoin's price volatility. And it's, it's amazing. This one is also a really good one. Coexisting monies. Talking about multi-coinery and shitcoinery. And why it's just nonsensical. Yes, there will be different, non, different scarce goods used uh, in exchange, but only one is money. And that is the hardest money to produce. That is Bitcoin. Custodial wallets is here's the next point. Again, um, he, he even says that there will be individuals holding their own keys. And that will keep all these inflationary fractional reserve uh, custodial wallets in check, as we have seen with Mt. Gox and uh, other stuff. And again, then fundamentally here, the summary, uh, which we are currently talking about. Um, I mean, Piers, wh what's your feedback? Is Rothbard a must read for every Bitcoiner? I, for 100% sure, would say so. Yes, because like, this part two, money in a free society, lays out everything you need to know about Bitcoin. And it destroys like all the FUD that individuals throw against Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's insane, truly, it is. Uh, Rothbard is just too good in this book. And it's written in the 1963. What? I mean, people say that Milton Friedman has predicted uh, a e-money. Well, nonsense. Rothbard has done so much before him and in a much more prevalent and eloquent way. So, Pierce, I wasn't joking when I said read Rothbard and use Bitcoin. The two go perfectly well hand in hand. And I hope that this guided reading uh, has helped you in your understanding of Bitcoin. Because for sure, it has helped me. <laughs> I mean, I remember countless times of rereading this pamphlet over and over again. And how utterly my mind was blown when I realized that private coinage of gold coins is the equivalent of software developers working on Bitcoin wallets. This is it blew my, it hurt, it physically hurt. And I hope I did not cause physical harm to you uh, with all these mind blows that are enclosed in this amazing book. Pierce, we will continue though uh, our discussion here with the part two and the government meddling with money, uh, which again, I go back to the first video where we go through all these, uh, but this is again a treasure trove. Uh, of information uh, that we will continue. It's a bit shorter than part four, uh, than part one, and it absolutely is is really really interesting, especially here the bimetallism part. 
a really cool. And of course, inflation, how this all uh, plays out. And I do think that this is a nice way of, of showing how Bitcoin might be attacked uh, by governments and how we can defend against it. Uh, so you know, uh, stay tuned. Uh, this will come and you can get, of course, all these shows as soon as I record them. Uh, which was here for part one, all in one sitting. Uh, that's why I was so excited about it. <laughs> um, and you can get access to all this um, as soon as I record them on teleco.in slash Hillebrand uh, Otherwise, one video a day, uh, which I think is uh, quite enough and hopefully will provide you quite enough uh, mind blows uh, every time you watch one of these. Pierce, thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to the upcoming videos and see you on the next show. And up to then, Read some more Rothbard because it's really useful. Thank you for joining me and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.